Well, the class is back with us. Hopefully those of you watching by DVD, you're ready with your Bibles and we welcome everyone back to session 22. This one will be on prophecy. In our last session, we talked about the final gift that has to do uh, with the eyes and that is leadership. The leader has a picture that they see out in the future. No one else sees it. The leader turns on the headlights of the car and people see out into the future and they get excited and they come alongside the leader to help the leader uh, accomplish what that picture is. And they do a good job and the leader does a good job, the church benefits. Well, a long time ago, I led a group of men in a Bible study. And one of the people in the Bible study was a man named Frank, a different Frank than one I've referred to before. He was the least liked person in our church. People didn't like Frank. And when Frank came around, they kind of moved away. If Frank stayed with them, they ignored him. And it wasn't so that Frank was such a bad man. It isn't that he had done things wrong or hurt the people by sinning against them. It was because Frank told them the truth about themselves. Frank had a way of coming up to you and saying, I just want you to know, God told me that you're doing this. Stop it. Well, no one wants to hear that kind of message. It, it tends to make you feel unliked, unwanted. And so people, being people, just naturally didn't want to be around Frank because maybe I'm next and Frank's going to say something to me. Frank had the gift of prophecy. And prophets lead a lonely life because they receive a message from God, just not audibly, just kind of a whisper that they hear in their head. A thought is planted there. And that thought becomes a message inside of the person that builds up and builds up more pressure. I got to share it. I got to share it until they can't stand it anymore and they go to the person and give the message. And as a result, they become often social outcasts. It is a very difficult job to be a prophet, but a very necessary job with some real rewards, both for the prophet as well as for the people of God. So let's turn to Romans chapter 12 once again, as we did in our last meeting. And let's look at where, in fact, it talks about this gift of prophecy. As we look at Romans 12, we're going to come down uh, to verse 6 again. And it says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. Prophecy is always listed as among the gifts that have the greatest impact in the church. It's listed up with uh, being an apostle, being a teacher. It's because when they speak, they are speaking the very words of God. They have a message that God has given them and they must communicate that message clearly and moreover, if they give a message that foretells future events, it better happen 100% or they're not a prophet, which we'll talk about some more. Well, we have in the past looked at different Greek terms for prophecy, and the Greek term for prophet is prophetia. Prophetia. And it can be seen in a number of passages. If you would turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where we have been many, many times, we're going to look at this Greek word of prophetia, which was also used in Romans chapter 12. We want to see uh, the word prophecy used in other settings. In 
verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes, To another, the gift of miraculous powers. To another, prophetia. Prophetia. Why this emphasis on Greek words? I mean, there's a joke in my country. When you don't understand something, you go, it's all Greek to me. I don't understand it. It's like Greek. Well, the Greek language used in the Bible is like French in that there's many subtle shades of differences in words. In my country, we have one word for love. Well, if I say to my brothers, hey, I love you, I mean something quite different than if I say to my wife, I love you. See the shadings there? In French, there are shadings of, of meanings. The same thing in the Greek. That's why it's so important to go back to the Greek and understand those different meanings. In the Greek, it, it's important. Is the word masculine or feminine? Is it used in a certain tense? Past, future, uh, present? So we, I'm emphasizing the Greek because as a seminary course on uh, spiritual gifts, it's important for seminarians to understand that Greek is learned for a reason. All right, then if we go down to verse 28, it's used one again, once again in a different context. There's a different word that's used here. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers. Second, prophets. And that is the term for the office of prophet, not the spiritual gift of prophecy. However, a prophet would have that gift. So in the Greek, it is said, prophetus, prophetus. Now, the word for uh, prophecy, uh, prophetia, is G4394. And the word for the office of prophet, prophetus, is G4396. The literal meaning of the word prophecy is to speak forth. To speak forth. It's declaring God's purposes through the inspiration and to do so in one of three forms. First, it can be a warning to the wicked or the fallen. Second, it can be comfort to the, the afflicted and the hurting. And third, it can be revealing things that are hidden. That is, telling what's going to happen in the future. Not like a gypsy who has a crystal ball and, or the tarot cards that tell you or looking at your hand. Those are all worldly things that aren't true. This is the message that God has given and it's something that's going to happen. So three different forms. One is a warning, one is comfort, and one is the future. Those are the three. The definition that we're going to use for prophecy is to speak the mind and counsel of God. And God gives the message, the prophet speaks it, and people receive counsel, advice, or God's opinion, or God's command of what should be done, depending on the situation. Well, what's the purpose of the gift of prophecy in the body of Christ? Well, the spiritual gift of prophecy is to declare God's rebuke. Stop it. To give comfort to those that are hurting. Or tell people that in the future, this is what's going to happen. And those are three very important purposes in the body. Now, the role that we have talked about before, there are several different roles. As you remember from the past, founding the church, instructing the church, comforting the church, managing the church, giving a special message to the church. This falls into uh, the one that is instructing the church. 
You'll notice that in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 12, it was put up there with teachers. Prophets and teachers go together. Often prophets have the gift of teaching. In fact, the gift mix for them not only includes teaching, but often includes discernment, it includes knowledge, it includes wisdom. Coming alongside to help the prophet do the prophet's job. I looked at the commentators again. Chuck Smith says this, Prophecy is men speaking forth the word of God through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They speak forth God's word to God's people. That's a very important task. Previous things I've talked about my own failure in teaching and how I was convicted about I'm speaking to a thousand people and I've given a message that is false. A prophet has a much different uh, punishment if they are wrong, as we'll see down the line. David Guzik, another commentator we've used, says, It is the telling forth of God's message in a particular situation, and it's always in line with the Word of God and with His current work in the world. If one claims to be a prophet today, then let them be held to the standard of a prophet in the Old Testament. They better be a hundred percent accurate in every word they say. Now you'll open your Bible to where the punishment is, and that is in Deuteronomy, and go to chapter 13. This is a section in the Old Testament talking about different roles and responsibilities that people have. The priests and the Levites and other members of uh, the, then the congregation of Israel. And when we go down to verse 20, listen to what happens if a prophet isn't 100% right. Not just 99% right, 100% right. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. Wow. I'm not sure that in today's uh, world that means that we go out and behead the prophet. I think it means that there is a spiritual death for the prophet. They lose the office of prophecy, of being a prophet. Once they have given a message that is false, they are no longer a prophet. And they should be shunned by the church because in essence, they have been led astray to give a message that was not of God and people could never trust them again. And do you know that in the Old Testament, prophets made over 300 foretelling of who the Messiah would be, what he would be like, what he would do, through over 300, every one of them were tr was true. Every prophecy came true that was written about the prophets in the Old Testament about Jesus Christ. So the, this is a very high standard and one that you, you can't make a mistake even one time or you have a very serious punishment. You know, I love that the Bible itself often commentates on the Bible. And while we're not going to turn there, in another session coming up, we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians 14. And in that chapter, Paul talks about prophecy and tongues, and he compares the two. What's the value of both of them, and what is their place in the body of Christ? So the Bible will commentate on prophecy and we'll go over it in the future. And for me, I have benefited greatly from prophets. And I am grateful for a prophet who stands up and without any uh, anxiety, without being afraid, they declare a message that is not going to be taken well by the person. And when they're declaring something that's going to happen in the future, I have found prophets are right. 100% of the time. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. 
Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. We've used vi visual aids in the past to help us understand this gift of prophecy. I would like you to think of a laser pen. Now perhaps you haven't seen these things, but teachers are very familiar with them. And as I describe it, you may in fact re remember having seen it. It is a little tube that the teacher holds. And when they have said something and written it on the board, they point to that and the laser beam shines to that and they can kind of highlight. That's what you're supposed to remember. Well, just as a laser beam directs your eyes towards the message on the board, the spiritual gift of prophecy directs you to the message that God has given. It's like a laser pointer saying, all right, pay attention. Of all the things I've said, this is the part that's important. And when they say things, they direct attention to correction of people, to warning of people, to comfort, and to revelation. And a prophet uses the metaphorical laser pen to emphasize their words. Now let's look at the biblical view of prophets. I've said there's three different contexts that prophecy, the gift of prophecy is used. And the first one is when a prophet rebukes. So there's no definition of prophecy in the Bible. Let's go and look at an example of a prophet who was rebuking someone. And that prophet was Jeremiah. So if you would turn to that verse, please, and we'll take a look at Jeremiah who is issuing a rebuke to the people of Israel. Please go to Jeremiah chapter 2, right in the beginning of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is sometimes called the weeping prophet because he constantly is pouring out nothing but bad news for, for the people of Israel. In fact, God told him in the beginning, people are not going to pay attention to what you say. You're going to spend your whole life giving messages of warning and nobody's going to pay attention to you. Oh, there's a real happy thought. I'm going to invest my whole life in giving a message and nobody's going to listen to me. However, God tells him, but the things you declare will in fact come to happen. And what he declared most of all is, you are messing up and God will judge you. And in fact he did. Twice he sent them into exile from uh, their home in Jerusalem. So here is what, uh, in Jeremiah 2 down to verse 4, this is what Jeremiah says to the house of both Jacob and Israel, all the people of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, all you clans of the house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Now those are pretty strong words. You better know what you're talking about when you say to somebody, oh, by the way, this is what the Lord says. I mean, you're kind of putting it all on the line there. And you're saying, I have received a message and I am telling you, this is what the Lord says. Laser beam. Pay attention. In verse 5, this is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me? That they strayed so far from me. They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priest did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal following worthless idols. 
Therefore, I bring these charges against you. And then he talks about what's going to happen. And the first thing he says is, I'm not only going to bring it against you, and I will bring charges against your children's children. Three generations. So this is a, not exactly a comforting message. It is a message of rebuke. And later, throughout this message, there's always hope. There's always, if you turn back to me, if you confess your sins, if you follow me once again, these things will not happen. But as we know, the people of Israel paid no attention. They went ahead living their lives as they always did, and they suffered the consequences for it. And that message should ring home with us, that if we continue to wander from God, living things our own way, not paying attention to Him, and this happens over a period of time, there will be judgment. There will be a time that something will happen so that God catches your attention and brings you back. And often, it will be a prophet who comes and gives you the message. All right, that's the bad news. Now let's look at the good news when a prophet brings comfort. If you would go just one book of the Bible uh, earlier to Isaiah and go to Isaiah chapter 40, we'll see an example of Isaiah giving comfort to God's people. There are 66 books in the Bible. It's interesting that in the book of Isaiah, there are 66 chapters. In the Bible, the first 39 books are the Old Testament. The last 26 books are the New Testament. So when you get to verse 40 in Isaiah, all of the previous part, chapters 1 through 39, just like in the Old Testament, uh, just like in uh, Isaiah's writing, there's bad news. Stop doing it. You're wandering from me. Come back to me. I love you. I care for you. I've done these good things, and yet you've turned your back on me time and time again. And then it gets to what is, in essence, the New Testament, verses, uh, chapters 40 through 66. And so there's a, a huge break here. Verse 1 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. And in the very next verse, it talks about John the Baptist, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. And what he's saying is, in the first 39 chapters of my book, God's giving you nothing but bad news. And he promises, now the hard service is through. You paid your punishment. You went off to exile. You came back. And you will receive from God a double portion of blessing for every sin you committed. Comfort. That is a prophet comforting people. And there's one more. How about a prophet who foretells the future? Well, let's go to the New Testament and go, please, to the book of Acts. And turn to Acts chapter 11. And in Acts chapter 11, there's just a little snippet of a uh, story about a prophet we only hear about one time, Agabus. Agabus is only mentioned here, but he's mentioned in the context of foretelling the future. So if you go down in Acts 11 to verse 27, it says, During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Let me mention that in the very early church, the center of Christianity shifted from Jerusalem to the church of Antioch. Much like we talked about before, that the center of Christianity is shifting from North America to South America, we find a similar thing here in the Bible. 
Jerusalem was where the, all the action took place. But it was the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now all of a sudden, the action shifts to Antioch. And that's the place that's kind of the center of the Christian world. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Holy Spirit, important words, through the Holy Spirit, predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. He came down from Jerusalem, went to Antioch, and he said, hey guys, the Holy Spirit's told me there's going to be this famine. It's going to be all throughout the Roman world. It happened. That's a prophet. And had it not happened, he would have been killed because he is not giving the word of God. Now, whether he would have been physically killed or if he would have been ostracized and put out of the church and experienced uh, relational and spiritual death, we don't know. But Agabus is a prophet who gives the example of a prophet foretelling the future. I have a personal example to share where a prophet confronted me. You see, after my wife died, I didn't just go, oh well, I guess God's God and he knows what's best. <laughs> Hardly. I went, what are you doing, God? Why did you take my wife at age 51? Why, God, why? I don't understand it. Where are you? Then a month later, my mother-in-law died. Why? Then I left my job. Why? Then my kids left. Why? Then my best friend left. Why? And then my mother died. Why? My father-in-law died. All within three years, I turned my back on God. For one solid year, I did not go to church. It was a little bit like being a child going, well, if that's what you're going to do, I'm not going to church. So there. Like I was hurting God. And God was gracious with me and brought a prophet into my life who helped me cut through the clutter and see that my behavior was wrong. This was a warning from the person and a wake-up call. A friend of mine who is in charge of the ministry I served in, whose name is Debbie, I was bemoaning my life and, oh, woe is me, look at all that God is doing. You know, I'm... And she looked at me and said, Steve, I have some questions to ask you. First, is there a God or not? Does he love you or not? Does he have a good plan for you or not? Will you obey him and follow him or not? It's your choice. That was a wake-up call. It was like rhetorical question time. Is there a God? Of course. I never doubted he was there. It just seemed like he went away. Does he love you? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I've had some examples. It just doesn't feel like it right now. Does he have a plan for your life? kind of wonder sometimes, but okay. I, I've seen it in the past. And will you follow him? When she laid it out like that, the only thing I could say was yes, 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 yes. What am I doing? I'm so sorry, Lord. And I confessed and returned to the church and was grateful for a prophet who had the courage to come to me with a message that wasn't going to be taken very well and broke through all of my sinfulness to actually bring me to the point where I knew I had sinned and I confessed. Well, I have some questions for you, as I have before. So answer these questions in your mind. And if you have a yes to one or more of these questions, perhaps you have the gift of prophecy. Has God worked in your life too? Number one, receive and proclaim a message 
to another believer that you knew came from God? Two, has God worked through your life to be able to share a message with God that hurt another person? Have you been able to share a message that perhaps comforted the people? Have you been able to share a message that in some way told what was going to happen, and it did? And finally, question three, has God worked in your life to be able to stand alone, confront the issue, despite the fact you may lose a friend and receive criticism and be alone? Have any of those things happened in your life? Not a pleasant life, but one that brings great joy because God has used you. God has spoken to you. And through it, lives have been changed and the church has been served. Let us honor our prophets and give them the opportunity to exercise their gift of prophecy. And let us take it with a humble spirit knowing that it's really God speaking to us. Well, in our next session, we're going to go on and we're going to begin to look at the other gifts that have to do with the mouth. And in this case, we'll look at teaching. Come on back and join us.